Exposing the New World Order, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on the Global Star Radio Network. Stand by. You know, I often say a view from cruising altitude gives us our best view, best uh, best wide-angle view of what's going on. How about a view from Mars? That's right, a view from Mars. Visit Jim Mars at jimmars.com for that view from Mars. That's two R's, M-A-R-R-S, jimmars.com. He's our guest right now. What a fabulous, uh, what, just what a fabulous guest, a very pro- prolific author, New York Times bestseller. Uh, we're going to be talking this segment about our occulted history, putting some, connecting some dots, actually. Before we get to Jim, I might just want to mention that uh, rocket stoves are the way to go. I have to relate a story just very quickly. I, of course, I use Minuteman rocket stoves, tried them out, love them. Uh, Minuteman Rocket Stove. If you go to MinutemanStove.com, that's MinutemanStove.com. You can see what I'm talking about. These are the uh, reinforced ammo cans, if you will, that provide a heat source for any type of an emergency, and they are fantastic. I actually put, uh, on my way to the studio, I put the uh, uh, rocket stove on top. You know, folks, you know, you know what I did? I put it on top of my, uh, my vehicle, on the hood. And as I was driving out of the driveway, on my way to the studio, I hear this awful racket. And I thought, I, man, I, I didn't know what, what, what happened. I thought maybe... Um, uh, somebody threw a rock or something at my car, and the, the stove tumbled off of the, the roof of my car onto the back and onto the ground. Now, you ordinarily, you would think a product like that wouldn't survive that fall. Let me tell you, it uh, survived, survived it just fine. So, folks, in these uncertain times, it just makes sense to have a, a sustainable backup method for accomplishing one of life's most important tasks, that's preparing food. This is the way to go. There is nothing better than a Minuteman rocket stove from MinutemanStove.com. Nothing better at all. And they hold up when you put them on the hood of your car and drive off. Uh, no, I, I would dare say you, other, other stoves would not. We all need a way to cook and a method to process water. Of course, the disruption of power. I mean, think about it. Think about the many things that could happen to you uh, or happen to the fuel distribution, the, the, the power supply. We'll have something in your ready-to-go bag or your pantry. Minuteman Rocket Stove can provide your family or group the perfect solution, and that is it's small, lightweight, wood-burning, and every bit as powerful as a kitchen stove with decent wood. It's smokeless, fully self-contained for clean storage and transport. Because it's so efficient, it cuts down on your wood gathering and processing chores to a tenth. And I mean a tenth of what would be required if cooking the old-fashioned way, like an, over an open fire. So don't rely on gas or fuel stoves. You can, but don't, because eventually the supply is going to run dry. Burning wood inefficiently requires a lot of manual labor. This stove, only at MinutemanStove.com, at least that's where, at MinutemanStove.com, is the way to go. It solves all of your problems. It's easy to feed um, and easy to use. Prepare your family. Prepare for yourself. Order a Minuteman rocket stove today. It's going to make bad times much better. Lane Miller, he's the owner. Go to Minuteman. Go to the website, MinutemanStove.com, and take a look at his crew. This is all American-made, made in the U.S. American jobs, American labor, American it's an American product. The stoves come with a two-year warranty even when you drive off with them on your hood and they bounce around and they last. So MinutemanStove.com, great, uh, just a fantastic product, MinutemanStove.com. Our guest, again, Jim Mars, so great. Uh, he's su- such a gracious man and so intelligent. Jim, thanks for um, bearing with me. As I fly solo, Joe will be back on Monday. Of course, he's nursing a, a, a wounded ankle. and. Uh, uh, 
Uh, but 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 thanks for thanks for uh, granting us uh, being so gracious with your time. Let, let's get right into. Yeah, you mean thanks for filling up the airways? <laughs> <laughs> no. Since, uh, unfortunately, Joe's not there to help you. Oh, that's all right. Him. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's so it's so great. Now l- let's talk about uh, wherever you want to go. And I know your occult, uh, our occult of history. Your book is uh, kind of really causing a lot of uh, not controversy, but a lot a lot of people to talk because you make a lot of connections. You're talking about UFOs. Where do you want to start with right. this? Um, uh, it's it's hard to even know where to go. But l- l- quickly on UFOs. Again, when I started, I'd, I've been at it a long time, folks. And when I started off, and and any talk came up about UFOs, uh, it was there's no such thing. The government's position was they don't exist. Okay, uh, actually, all it was was just uh, delusions, misinterpretation of aircraft, uh, and p- possibly some kind of mass psychosis. Uh, it may sound strange today, but seriously, in the 50s, and 60s. This is what we were being told. <laughs> and, Doug, I thought, even as a young reporter, I thought, wow, what a story. A heretofore undiagnosed, contagious mass psychosis. You know, yeah. it's got to be a story. Well, you don't hear about that anymore. And the reason is because with the advent of the camcorder and, of course, today's ubiquitous cell phones with all, you know, that can take videos and photographs. Uh, If you go Google up UFOs, you could probably spend the rest of your life looking at the photographs we have now of UFOs. And it's not always just a light in the sky. There are craft. There are structures there. Okay, so the argument about do they exist, you don't hear that anymore. It's gone. Yes, they're here. The question becomes, who are they? What do they want? All right. Now, the key thing to remember is this is not a recent phenomenon. This goes all the way back through our earliest history. The uh, Hindu Vedas, which are probably amongst the oldest writings in the world, uh, talk about the flying Vyamas, okay, and how that they had even uh, uh, weapons that could destroy an entire city. Uh, you go back to the Sumerian civilization, Sumar, it's S-U-M-E-R, and and quickly let me differentiate that between, in the Bible, we read about the Good Samaritan and people from Samaria. That was an area of of Palestine, of that area over there. I'm talking about Sumar, S-U-M-E-R. This was the area in what is Iraq. It was between the Tigris-Euphrates River, and those people wrote down there history and their thoughts and all of their information uh, in cuneiform tablets. They would take clay and they used a stylus to write down everything they wanted to write down. And then they would bake that clay and turn it to stone. And there's thousands, in fact, half a million of these writings, tablets still in existence, but they're hidden away in various museums all around the world. And it was not until the mid-1800s that uh, anybody got around to try to translate them. So when they began to translate them, they found out about the Anunnaki. Well, the Anunnaki translates basically as those who came from the heavens and landed on the earth. Okay. Well, in the mid-1800s, The most advanced scientists had no concept of space flight or uh, atoms or uh, genetics, DNA. Uh, They just, you know, that they, they didn't know anything about that. So when they would read about these people who came and flew through the air, who landed, who taught law and and mathematics. Uh, architecture, they just wrote it all off as, well, that's their mythology. That's their gods. And you, in fact, you can go to the Encyclopedia Britannica today. If you look under Sumerian mythology, you'll find the whole story. The only thing that's changed in recent years, uh, starting with uh, the prolific number of books by uh, Zachariah Zitchin, who was a translator of the Sumerian language, but he's not alone. Uh, There are many others now. And what has happened is, is that our perception, the translations are the same. 
It's our perception of them and interpretation. More and more people are now believing that what they were talking about, and we wrote off as their mythology, is actually uh, history, what they actually knew. And in fact, if you start comparing the mythologies, you find that uh, they all have a line of similarity. Uh, for example, uh, in the Sumerian, they talked about their god who was in charge of the earth, and that was Enlil. Well, we find the Egyptians say, well, there was a lord over the earth that was set. The Greeks say, no, the, the lord over the earth was Zeus. And the Romans, of course, said, no, it's Jupiter. Okay, the names change because of the language change. But the characteristics and the uh, attributes of, of these characters remain the same. Now, am I trying to say that these were all gods? No, <laughs> they were uh, beings of advanced knowledge. In fact, uh, when I wrote my book, Crossfire, uh, not Crossfire, but Alien Agenda, um, I interviewed a woman who was a very devout Christian, and she had had one of these so-called abduction experiences. And they had taken her abo uh, aboard a ship. They had taken her to some other world, shown her things. And the whole time she's going, but, but what about God? Don't you believe in God? And, and she said, one of them finally turned to her and said, look, our God is your God, you know? And of course, if you stop and think about it, uh, the God of the universe is the God of the universe. Uh, and I think it, it's kind of arrogant for us to think that God made all of these billions of galaxies they contain billions of suns, they contain billions of worlds revolving around those suns, just so we'd have something to look at in the night sky. Uh, you know, if, if there is a God of the universe, which I believe there is, and I know you do too, Doug, most of your audience, I think, believes that, then mm -hmm. he's the God of the universe, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, so it's important to understand that these, what they called gods, or we'll simply call them the Anunnaki, because that's what they called them. In fact, in the writings of the ancient Sumerians, they never referred to them as gods. They just said the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki did this. They came here. They went there. They did this. You know, it's only the translators in the 18, 1800s who had no concept of space flight or of other worlds and all like that who said, well, the they they must be talking about their primitive gods. And so uh, it's really an amazing and, and expanding uh, understanding of the world and the universe. So according also to these tablets, these Anunnaki uh, decided that they, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, came here, and they decided they wanted to see if they could uh, create some workers somebody to do all the grunt work for them, okay? And so, uh, interestingly enough, uh, they, uh, their science officer, Inky, says, well, you know, I'm working with some Earth primitives in, down in what we now know is Africa. He says, I think I can uh, tweak their DNA a little bit and maybe upgrade them a little bit, and we can make a worker race to do the work for us. Now, interestingly enough, in the Council of the Anunnaki, they had the same moral debates that we have today about cloning and about uh, genetic manipulation. And they were saying that, hey, you know, we can't play God. There is a God of the universe, and, and he's the creative force, and, and that's not up to us. So it's important to understand that what Inky ordered uh, or argued was that, well, look, we're not creating anything. We're just improving the breed, all right? Just exactly as we do with sheep, horses, cows, dog, cats, okay? We've not, we haven't created any of those, but we improve the breed. We use crossbreeding uh, for centuries to produce, uh, you know, horses that can run a little faster, cats that have not so long hair, 
uh, and all like that. So it's 